Hello. Hello. Hello, Zubi. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing well, thanks. How about yourself? Perfectly well. I'm in Serbia. I'm away from this madness. Oh, <laughs> how's, the situation, how's the situation in Serbia? Is it pretty normal? Well, it's quite mild compared to, to Western Europe, but they, okay. they have some restrictions and they are vaccinating people, you know, massively. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's interesting to see how it's being handled in different places. It's different everywhere, you know. They are using, I suppose, this country, which is a poor country, as a sort of lab to test five or six competing vaccines. Uh, yeah, it's, re it's messed up over here. The UK is in a bad situation. I would really like to understand how UK could get you into this madness. Sure. I've been following you. I, I was wondering that so few people who have a voice, who have a public, an audience, react to this thing. Yeah. I mean, this, this, this extends beyond all that's been happening over the past year. Um, you know, people in the Anglosphere, you know, the... Mm -hmm. the the, yeah, you know, the UK, the USA, Canada, Australia, New Zealand in particular. I don't know why it's, especially the English speaking countries, but I know this goes, applies to some of Western Europe as well. People are, people are afraid, right? People are afraid of speaking out. Political correctness has gone way beyond any reasonable level and people are afraid to speak their minds in very basic ways even if something is a very popular opinion it's a very mainstream opinion etc this goes like i said this this was happening way beyond way before the pandemic but people are just very afraid to speak up they've been silenced and cowed over a period of time you know i mean yeah. it's over several over several decades and i think that now what's happening even with the pandemic and when it comes to speaking out about things that people are concerned about or asking questions or pushing back, et cetera. If you talk to a lot of people uh, privately, then they'll say all this. Th they will say all the things I'm saying yeah. if you speak to them <laughs> privately one-on-one, -on -one, but people don't want to put their head above the parapet. They're afraid of this so-called cancel culture. They're afraid of getting some flack. They're afraid of losing their jobs. They're afraid of all sorts of, potential repercussions, which in my mind, honestly, are vastly over-exaggerated. It's not yeah. to say that they don't exist at all. Of course, we've seen people face repercussions for saying very basic things, um, but people have just been, been cowed over time. So I think there's a pandemic of cowardice, which is going on, and people are not wanting to stand out from the crowd. As we know, I think the, the greatest human fear is fear of judgment from other people, right? People don't want to be looked at as, a, yeah, as a bad person or as a, you know, oh, one of these scary conspiracy theorists or anti-vaxxers or whatever, right? And people like to throw these labels at people to get them to shut up, right? People want to throw, they think if you, they just call you with this name, it will make you shut up. We've been yeah. seeing it happening over the last decade plus where someone just expresses a basic opinion on something and someone says, oh, you're a racist. Yeah. Right. And that's that's done to shut people up. It's not done because in 90 percent of cases, it's not because they said anything that was even remotely close to racist. Mm -hmm. It's just that people have learned, hey, if you call someone racist, you can get them to shut up and you can dismiss their opinion and you don't need to take them seriously. Now, in this situation, if you can say that someone is uh, a conspiracy theorist or an anti-vaxxer or that they don't believe in science, then you can dismiss them or you can say that uh, they want to kill your grandma, their grandma killer. You can just throw this label on something and it mm -hmm. shuts up it shuts up most people right it most yeah. people don't nobody likes to be called names mm -hmm. <laughs> nobody likes to be called names i don't like to be called names but i'm very confident in who i am so i'm the type of person just my personality it's 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 impossible to silence me by just calling me something that i'm that i'm not you know yeah. um but that's not the case for most people and i guess also in my situation um you know, I am, I am self-employed and I do, I'm not beholden to anybody else, but that in itself isn't all. I mean, there are people who are in much better positions than I am to speak out on things, but again, they're so afraid of any kind of judgment, any kind of name calling, any online mobs, cancel culture, all of this stuff that, that they won't say mm -hmm. even what they know to be true. I mean, we're living in a time literally where it's considered controversial to say that there are only two genders and men cannot get pregnant. Men cannot menstruate. Um, you know, women don't have penises. 
these are now controversial things to say, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, in the, everyone knows that this is true, mm -hmm. but this is somehow we're living in this weird time where that's considered if a controversial statement. If I go on TV and I say that there are only two genders, I'm going to, I'm going to have to get ready for some backlash. Right. Of course. And that's insane because we, we, we know that this is true. It's been true for forever, right? <laughs> it, but somehow around, but somehow 10 years ago or seven years ago, they decided that, Oh no, like we're, we're changing this. And um, I think that, I know you said that you're in Serbia. I feel like yeah. Eastern, the, the truth is the majority of the world isn't, hasn't caught up with this madness. So if you no. go to Africa, if you go to most parts of South America, most parts of Asia, Eastern Europe, um, a lot of most places, they're not, they're not on this bandwagon of not just political correctness, I, I'd say actually cowardice and, and rejecting reality, right? Yeah, actually rejecting, yeah. re rejecting reality itself, which is, which is scary to me, right? That's very dystopian, right? If you can convince yeah. somebody that um, the sky is red, and then you become a heretic for telling people the sky is blue or the sky is actually gray, and people are trying to attack you for that when you're just telling the truth that you can see with your own eyes, then we're living in a very dangerous circumstance because um, it it seeks to usurp actual reality. So that that's scary. Like if people are no longer willing to, if re, if if reality itself becomes an opinion, then um, I think society is in trouble. Yeah, you really uh, got into the point very quickly. I, I was I was about to ask you uh, what was the purpose of whatever you do because. Uh, you seem to be very self-confident as a person into mm -hmm. your opinions, into what you are and, 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 and what your mission in this world is. Yeah. And uh, that's what I also noticed with uh, many people, that they, they don't know who they are, mm -hmm. what their opinions are, what the meaning of their life is. So, they, so they, are, they are afraid. I mean, fear is a product of personal inner inconsistency, I think. Mm -hmm. So I think that we have, we, ha we have to deal with, with a sort of psychological pandemic of um, unidentification by people. I, I agree. I agree. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I agree totally. I don't really know what to, <laughs> I don't really know what to add to that. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so, so the problem is uh, there is a mi minority of people. I, th I, I don't know. It's my, my observation. There's a minor minority of people who consider that two plus two is four. Yes. And a majority that can be convinced that two plus two is anything. Do you, know, do you know what? I think that the people who can be convinced it's anything are actually a very small minority, mm -hmm. but they are very, they're very loud. You know, mm -hmm. I think that the truth is the majority of people, and this goes with most things, the majority of people do not want to rock the boat, right? The majority yeah. of people, the majority will always be the majority, right? That's what I mm -hmm. always say. Like the majority will behave like the majority. Mm -hmm. So uh, the people who are really pushing the crazy ideas can be less than 5% of the yeah. population. But then also the people like myself who are willing to vocally stick their head up and speak mm -hmm. out in resistance or in opposition are also a very small minority, right? The majority mm -hmm. of people will just kind of go along to get along. Mm -hmm. um, even, if, even if they're not comfortable with it or they have questions or they're not totally on board, at, mm -hmm. at most, normally, they'll sort of dissent privately, right? In their own head, in their own, amongst their friends who they know it's safe, you know, they'll talk about the, all of these things, mm -hmm. but they wouldn't put it on social media or they wouldn't express it in the workplace or they wouldn't say it at school or at work or at university, et cetera, because they're afraid of the backlash, right? I do think that sane people um, on most things are actually the majority, but th th there can be this, uh, it it's silencing, right? It's creating this chill mm. where you're, you've allowed a small minority of people to sort of set the rules and set the boundaries and not just set them, but enforce them. <laughs> you know, I, I say it just because it's such a ridiculous notion, right? The, the percentage of people who believe that a woman can have a penis or a man can get pregnant is a very small minority, but it's a very vocal and aggressive minority. And they are willing to, uh, I mean, we've seen this all throughout history, right? A, a, a small, aggressive, motivated minority can, can cow mm -hmm. um, a large percentage of the population, Yeah, right? Which allows them to run roughshod. And, and it also creates the illusion 
that they are far more numerous than they are. Yeah. Like they could create this illusion that, oh, wow, you yourself start thinking, wait, am I in the minority? But no, you're actually in the, you're actually in the majority, but everyone else is quiet. And especially in this online world with social media, um, yeah. you know, a couple thousand people can make it look like it's hundreds of millions of people even yeah. though actually a really small number of people doing something. But like I say, most people are quite, um, you know, and maybe this is sensible, right? Most people are conflict averse. Most people mm. would rather avoid conflict, avoid arguments, avoid fights, et cetera. Um, and the truth is most people don't really have particularly strong principles that they are willing to push back on and fight against, right? People always say, yeah. hey, this isn't the hill to die on. This isn't the hill to die. You know, some people have no hill, that they are willing to die on. So they'll kind of keep bending over backwards and bending over backwards. And I don't think they realize, um, or if they do, again, the cowardice has just gotten a hold of them, how, how far some of this stuff can go, right? Yeah. Um, people aren't seeing, okay, so in this situation we're dealing with, with the pandemic, um, I've been speaking out against this for over one year now, very mm -hmm. vocally. I've been called all sorts of names, et cetera, because from the beginning, I've seen, okay, this response doesn't make sense and it is disproportionate, okay? Yeah. This is yeah. not me saying that uh, COVID doesn't exist or it hasn't killed anybody or this or that, but if you have a rat in your house, you do not burn down the entire house yeah. to kill the rat. And I've been saying this for a long time. These lockdowns, these restrictions, they have very, very severe repercussions, which, which also compound the longer it goes on. Yeah. Um, and they've moved the goalposts so many times. They've lied to us so many times. They said that masks don't work. And now they're saying you have to wear a mask. And then in some places, they're even saying you should wear two. Uh, they said that this was going to be two to three weeks to flatten the curve, get PPE, slow the spread, don't overwhelm the hospitals, right? This whole thing was sold to us on a two to three week, okay, two to three week lockdown. Most people were okay with that. Not a lot of pushback. But then mm. they see it, people keep complying and complying. And I'm like, people don't understand how far things can escalate, right? And also yeah. most people don't look at, most people don't read history either. So they're not looking at, okay, all these, all these crazy things that happened even in the 20th century, whether you're talking about the rise of Nazism, the rise of communism yeah. in different parts of the world, uh, some of these dictatorships in you know, the Middle East and Africa, like people don't see how things escalate, right? It's not on day yeah. one, it, it all goes crazy. It's like, okay, this happens and then this happens. And, and once people start becoming afraid to speak mm -hmm. and afraid to uh, question authority and afraid to, then you're actually in a very dangerous position because, you know, or, or something that freaks me out, you know, with this whole, uh, when they're talking about these, uh, I don't even want to call them COVID pass. I don't even want to call them COVID passports because that's too kind. They're more like uh, freedom licenses, essentially. Mm -hmm. I mean, this would literally create a tier two tier society that would mm -hmm. create essentially medical apartheid, right? So yeah, yeah. we've now split the population as has been done many, many times. Okay, this is this group of people has this privileges and these rights and these freedoms, and this group does not, right? We've seen mm -hmm. this play out in history many times along racial lines, along sex lines, along ethnic lines, along all yeah. sorts of different lines. And the result is never pretty. No, right? never. The result is awful. At, at, at the worst, it can literally end up with genocide, like very literally. Yeah. So I'm, I'm just like, look, this is a dangerous, this is a dangerous road. Uh, this isn't the path to freedom. This isn't the path to normality. We already had freedom and we already had normality. So especially in a country like the UK, even more so in a country like the UK, I mean, over 90% of the population that makes up 90% of the, of the deaths and hospitalizations has already been vaccinated. This yeah. is the most vaccinated one of the most vaccinated countries in the world. So every day, the, the sort of argument for this stuff gets weaker. And um, yeah, that, that's the part that, that, that concerns me greatly because we are supposed to live in a free country, right? The, yeah. UK, is not, the UK is not North Korea. It's not a China. It's not Soviet. It's not the Soviet Union, et cetera, right? It's okay, you know, UK free liberal uh, democracy. Yeah. And it's like, okay, so they, they made it illegal for months on end to people to see their family to see their friends, to even go outside without uh, you know, a reasonable excuse, as they call it. They've made it illegal to go on holiday. <laughs> um, they've made it, all, all of these things. And I'm, I've been sounding this alarm and I'm like, guys, this is not, this is not normal, this is not right. Mm -hmm. This is dangerous on multiple levels, et cetera. But again, um, you know, British people in general are, are pretty compliant yeah. and pretty trusting of the government, right? And so 
in normal times, that's not always a bad thing. You know, people follow yeah. the rules and things mm -hmm. are quite orderly, but in a situation like this, to me, it's a disaster. Cause it's like, oh my gosh, like people, it's like, people don't have a breaking point. Like, where's the limit? You can keep increasing the rules and increasing the rules and increasing the rules and people aren't even pushing back again. In fact, people are even supporting it um, no, no, no. For, for all these various reasons. And so that's part of why I've been, um, yeah. And also because I know so many people are being silenced. So I uh -huh. feel a little bit of a moral and an ethical duty to, as someone who does have a much larger platform than, you know, 99.99% .99 of people, um, I also feel it's my duty to represent the other side of the argument and voice some of these questions and concerns that other people are not doing. Um, if I catch some flack from that, then okay. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, people are always saying, oh, you're so courageous. You're so, I'm like, to me, that's not, that's not courage, man. To me, courage is being, you know, on the on the on the front lines of a of a physical battle or yeah, exactly you know exactly. running into, running into a burning building or something yeah. like that i'm just putting <laughs> stuff out on twitter i'm talking on podcasts i'm just sharing i'm just openly sharing my opinions and asking questions you know and if someone disagrees with me on something i'm very open-minded people can disagree with me people can ask me questions if they think i'm wrong they can tell me where they think i'm wrong whatever i'm very open to conversations i'm not here trying to shut down anyone else or to censor them or to stop them talking whatever it's just saying okay look there are lots of different this is a very multifaceted issue. There's a lot mm -hmm. of different sides that we need to consider. Uh, not just how many people are dying of COVID, which we don't even know, by the way. No, it's not just one variable, right? There's all these variables. So other aspects of physical health, mental health, the economy, um, people's finances, people's jobs, the impact on children, uh, the impact on depression and suicide rates and all of that, the amount of debt that's being created. All of these things, you know, not to mention uh, the infringements on freedoms and civil liberties, all of these things are, are considerations, but it's like you've taken a problem with all these dozens of variables and people are trying to narrow it down to no. one yeah. single variable. And also, um, you know, either you're this or this, right? So either... So if I if I speak out against lockdowns, people, you know, suggest... It's a very dishonest tactic. People say, oh, so you, you, think, you think we should do nothing. Yeah, and yeah, it's like, yeah. is are the only options doing nothing, or shutting down sixty five million people and locking them in their houses for months and months on end? Like, surely there is a there's a lot of middle ground between those things, but people don't really want to have the conversation, so that's why they throw out insults, and it's also why they create these false dichotomies. I read your latest uh, tweet on on the topic. You said believing that healthy people are sick and thus treating them as such is literally a mental disorder. Do you think that we are yeah. being ruled by people who suffer from mental disorders? Oh, no, I don't think we're being ruled by them. But I think that the level of propaganda that mm -hmm. has been instilled over the past what, 13, 14 months now is giving people mental disorders. I think people have become, not everybody, but people have developed, you know, hypochondria, right? Yeah. People are there acting like, you know, there are people who every time they, they buy their groceries, they, they cover the whole, they, they put bleach on it, no. <laughs> um, and you, you know, or they're running around outside with like a face mask and a shield and their gloves. And I, I, I mean, the virus doesn't even spread outside. And so yeah. people are behaving like hypochondriacs, but then they're also treating everybody else as if they are sick, right? Mm -hmm. So all of the rules, all of the guidelines, whatever, it's all based on this notion that you know, in the UK, they have posters up saying, act like you've got it, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, that's actually promoting mental illness because you're not meant to act like you are sick. If you are not sick, if you're perfectly healthy, um, you don't act like you're sick and other people shouldn't be looking at you mm -hmm. as if you're just a disease vector, right? People yeah. have been trained to just see human beings as, oh my gosh, this guy could have COVID. That guy could have COVID. This woman can have COVID. Like everyone, my child, my dog, everyone has COVID. And it's really unhealthy actually. And mm -hmm. I think it's very damaging to the fabric of society because what makes human beings human is our, our social bonds and our connections and seeing people and seeing smiling faces and talking to people, not, you know, oh. swerving people in the street and everyone hiding their faces with masks and, you know, people distancing them. There are people who haven't seen their own parents for yeah. over one year, yeah. not because they're sick or because, they, but, but because, you know, essentially the government told them to, and they've, they're so fearful. And to me, that's all just, that's all just crazy. You know, it's a combination of hypochondria, 
Munchausen, Munchausen by proxy, all of which we know are actual mental disorders. So I think that, uh, yeah, I mean, the problem, it, it's like all these other pandemics have been created um, mm -hmm. off of the back of this one, which, um, you know, which again, and you know, this upsets people when you say it, but really is, is very mild for the vast majority of the population. Yeah. Um, you know, in the UK, in most countries, 90% of the people dying approximately are over the age of 60 with pre-existing conditions. Mm -hmm. um, the, the number of young people dying from this is, the percentage of you dying from this if you're young and in, in decent shape, it's virtually zero. It's virtually mm -hmm. zero, which is good. Right? Yeah. That's a good thing. Um, you know, it's sad that it, people dying from anything is sad, right? You, you, yeah. you, <laughs> we all kind of, we know that we all good, we all die, everybody dies. Um, but, you know, we don't want, you know, every, every life absolutely matters, but we also know there's a difference between somebody who is 85 years old dying of a disease and someone who is 25 years old dying of a disease, right? Of um, and people have been dying all the time. I mean, I, in the UK, I believe the average age of death um, with COVID is around 81, 82 years old, which mm -hmm. is literally the same as the, the average life expectancy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. So, and, and people just don't want to speak about this honestly, or they try to misinterpret you, they'll hear me saying this and they'll say, oh, so you're saying old people don't matter or you don't care if old. I'm like, dude, can we just be honest here, right? Like, why can't we have an honest conversation? And, and we've known that it's elderly people who are dying and being hospitalized. We've known this for over one year. We've known this yep. for over one year. The data is from all the countries. So I, for, I've been saying, these are the people who need to be prioritized and protected, right? Yep. Putting, locking up a 20 year old in their house for one year, makes absolutely no sense. Shutting down all the gyms makes absolutely no sense, right? People who are elderly and at risk, they need yeah. to be protected, shielded, yeah. shielded, et cetera, you know, within reason, based on what they want as well. Um, and everyone else can get on with life. People even keep saying, you know, we need to protect the NHS, protect the NHS. And I'm like, how is the NHS funded? The, N the mm -hmm. NHS is funded through tax, through uh, tax money. Yeah, from people who work. Our work and our yeah. labor. Yeah. Exactly, so if nobody is working, what is the long-term impact even on these public health services? It, it's so, it's so short-sighted. It's been so myopic. And it's like, people are not thinking about like, people are not thinking about all the different factors here. I'm sure there's a whole bunch of stuff I'm missing as well. And, and I'm not, and I'm, I'm a rapper. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm a rapper. I'm an author. I'm a podcaster. Like I'm not a politician. Yeah. I'm not a policy expert. I'm, I'm just someone who is a concerned citizen and who is a critical thinker and who likes to think of things from different angles and have conversations. So there's also a part of me, which is like, why am I the one who is, <laughs> why is it me who is, who is saying all of these things? Like the journalists should be asking yeah. these questions. But you are one of the rare people now who have a sort of historical concern, historical perspective on things. So all mm -hmm. these things already, as you, as you reminded us, all those things already happened. I mean, in the 20th century, we have, we have so many examples, but it was not called a, a pandemic. It was called you know, uh, uh, racial wars or, or whatever, or class wars. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if you could imagine that in the next century, within 100 years from now, there was a sensible historian, somebody looking at our time, how would he interpret the origins and the de development <laughs> of this madness? Wow. I, I guess it depends on who gets to write the history. <laughs> yeah, um, of course. But if they haven't, if they haven't, yeah. But if they have a remotely objective view, I think that they will see that this was a huge moral panic. It was a, a mass hysteria. It was a very disproportionate response. And I think it's, uh, you know, it was a huge psychological experiment. I mean, I think with all of these things, the psychology behind it is extremely interesting i mean it's, it's been extremely interesting for me even though it's it's disturbing um but yeah i think what has been keeping a lot of this going beyond just fear but it's also a sunk cost fallacy mm -hmm. and um cognitive dissonance and people just wanting to save face and protect their ego because mm -hmm. Nobody wants to say that, okay, all of this stuff that has been done over the past year, the, the masks, the closures, the, the, the lockdowns, the unemployment, the suffering caused, no one would want to say that it didn't make a big difference. Yeah. <laughs> right. Nobody, no. nobody is, certainly no politician 
Um, but even anyone who's been following all of this, no one would want to be like, okay, um, you know, we, it has to be justified. You have to be able to think in your brain, okay, we did all that and it was painful and it was difficult, but at least we saved, you know, we saved lives. Yeah, yeah, of course. And, and the evidence for that is, um, I mean, if you look at data across the different states in the USA, whether they lock down or not, you know, that the, the, there's no correlation. There's no correlation between these lockdowns and the mask mandates and um, and the actual death rates in different places. It seems like policy actually makes a v- relatively small difference um, mm-hmm. on these things. And, you know, people can cherry pick their places. If someone wants to justify lockdowns, they can, you know, they'll always cherry pick Australia, mm-hmm. New Zealand and South Korea. Right. They'll always pick those three countries and they'll say, see, like mm-hmm. it worked in New Zealand again, which is a little bit dishonest because New Zealand has like 10 people. Um, and it's an island that not a lot of people yeah. travel to. Um, mm. And so there's that. But then, you know, I can say, oh, well, look at all these U.S. states or look at look at Sweden, yeah. look at Belarus, uh, look at all these. You know, there's other places that didn't do it. And the truth is that any correlation is is pretty weak. It looks like the, mm-hmm. the thing that really determines the hospitalization and the death rates are things like, uh, you know, the climate, population density, whether or not places are travel hubs, the number mm-hmm. of people going in and out. Um, obesity rates, um, mm-hmm. median age of the population, all of these things, which are, um, you know, not re- not something that any government can really do something mm-hmm. about, you know, but, you know, just telling everyone to wear a mask or telling everyone to socially, right, it feels like you're really doing something and people feel that comfort like they're doing something. But um, there's always a big difference between doing good and feeling good. Yeah, right? yeah it's, easy to, it's easy to advocate for things that make people feel good. Um, or make them feel like, okay, they're doing something and they're being responsible rather than actually looking at, okay, what is the real, what's the real effect of this? And I'm someone who's very much in the latter category, which is, you know, I think how it, it does upset people a lot because I'm always thinking of like, okay, well, what's the, what's the reality of this? Like, forget what you feel, right? <laughs> you know, I know, mm-hmm. okay, if you wear a mask, you make it feel like you're protecting people and you're saving, but like, okay, let's, what's the evidence? What's the reality of this? What's the data? Let's compare places. Let's look at this, right? Let's forget about how it makes you feel, but let's look at the real impact, you know? And, and also let's look at the, the downsides, right? What are the potential downsides of this and what could come next, et cetera. So I'm always asking these questions. Um, yeah. I, just, I just like to ask a lot of questions. It doesn't even mean that I always know the exact yeah, answer. Yeah. Yeah. No, but, but, we should, but we should ask them, you know, when it comes to these... Uh, uh, you know, these jabs and injections, you know, the, these vaccines that are rolling out. Yeah. People should be asking, people should be asking questions. That doesn't make you an anti-vaxxer. It doesn't make you anti, in fact, it's pro-science, right? Yeah, like yeah. Pro-science is, is asking questions, right? And people get nervous and become even more conspiratorial if they feel mm-hmm. like they're not allowed to ask questions or certain questions aren't being answered. And there are some very obvious and big ones, you know, we don't know the long-term effects of these. It's impossible yeah. to. Yeah. Right. So if I, if someone's like, you know, pushing vaccines or whatever, and I say, okay, what are the long-term effects of this? They can't tell me. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and then they, you know, they're always going to, they'll try to call you a name or they'll what, and it's just like, okay, well, that's just a fact, right? That's not even me saying, oh, nobody should take this. It's just saying, okay, well, these are people's concerns. Here are 10 concerns that people have, you know, about, you know, the speed that it's come through, the fact it's gone through under emergency procedures. People are questioning, you know, questioning this new MRNA technology, we don't know what the long-term effects are. We don't know how long it lasts for. There's, you know, the fact that uh, there's all this sort of uh, coercion in certain places going on, trying to sort of threaten people to get, you know, all of that. These, these are legitimate concerns and questions, mm-hmm. which an honest person would be willing to answer. And, you know, I've had people, you know, I've, I've spoken to doctors. I have doctors in my family. I've spoken to people who, you know, answer these questions and concerns or even express some of their own. And, but in the public field, it's very, very difficult to, people don't really want to have those conversations in general. And to me, again, that's, that's, that's disturbing. And mm-hmm. a big part of this as well, man, a big part of this for me, and this goes across everything I've said is I always, I often say there's only three ways to solve a conflict, whether it's mm-hmm. interpersonal or it's on a national or international level, conversation, mm-hmm. separation, or yeah. physical violence. These are the only three ways you can solve something. It doesn't matter if it's with your friend, with your spouse, with your children, yeah. we're in between countries, whatever. So when when the discussion, when people don't want to discuss things or debate or have conversations, it automatically makes me nervous because it's like, yeah. okay, well, if you don't want to do that, either we have 
segregation and you go over there and I go over there and we mm -hmm. don't even communicate with each other or it leads to or it leads to violence right it leads yeah. to it leads to wars it leads to physical fights because you know that happens when the communication breaks down so i again i get nervous when people don't want to even don't even want to communicate they don't even want to entertain the debate they don't want to entertain the discussion then i'm like okay well you we've now lost one of the three options yeah so now it's either okay we just don't talk and we don't mm -hmm. communicate or it's like okay this is you know it eventually leads to people fighting and nobody wants that Obviously, we are now entering a, a phase where, where uh, physical coercion is, is considered normal, mm. which, you know, a year ago, nobody, nobody would have believed you if you had told them you will not be allowed to leave UK. No. Nobody would have, would have believed that. No, nobody would have believed that. And it's what's crazier is that the restrictions, you know, I mean, look, come Monday, I, I, hope, I hope that the tide is about to turn. Because mm -hmm. on Monday, a lot of stuff opened, a lot of the restrictions loosen on Monday. Yeah. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping that people fall out of totalitarianism as quickly yeah. as they fell into it. Right. Yeah. Especially with, you know, uh, you know, I want everyone who wants these vaccines to take them, even if it's for the fact of putting their minds at ease, because, because people are not thinking logically when they're this fearful. So I was like, look, if you, if, if that's what will make you calm down, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm all for it, right? Don't force it on me. Don't force it on other people. I literally don't need it. I've already got the uh, antibodies. Yeah. But, um, you know, I just want people to, you know, just chill out and become, it's like, it's like the, the country, not beyond just this country, lots of countries have just been swept over with, you know, panic and hysteria yeah. and fear. And a lot of it has been intentionally instilled by the government and the media, which, you know, it's going to be tough for me to, to, to forgive them for that, especially yeah. because yeah. they haven't even admitted any wrongdoing. Um, so I do hope, I do hope that, uh, the, the, this, this hysteria will actually calm down as quickly, as quickly as it built up and yeah. people will realize, you know, once people start seeing their friends and their families and all that, again, they'll, re they'll remember, oh, actually, yeah, normal life is actually quite good. And, um, I quite like, uh, having my freedoms and being able to go shopping and not having to put this thing over my face everywhere, et cetera. So, um, I, I think the fight is not over yet. I think yeah. we have to be very vigilant. People have to be vigilant and make sure that they get back all of their freedoms, which were, you know, I will say illegally taken. Um, but um, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm optimistic. I, I do believe that in the long term, uh, the, the human spirit always does win. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you a lot. It's very important that voices such as yours speak out. I listened to, to Van Morrison's songs. I don't know what happened with him after he spoke out. Did he, did he have a backlash or something? I'm not sure. I haven't really followed. Um, I've yeah. heard, I know that Van Morrison is one of the few yeah. musicians who has been speaking out. Um, I haven't really mm -hmm. followed that much of his mm -hmm. stuff. I think it's uh, Ian Brown from the Stone Roses here, yeah. I think has been speaking out as well. Um, I do follow him online. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's pretty quiet. And again, in my experience, the vast majority of musicians and entertainers are very much anti-lockdown. Um, yeah. It makes sense, right? Yeah, of course. But, of course. but yeah, but again, people don't want to, people don't want to say anything. No, they don't want trouble. They don't want to risk, uh, they don't want to risk their career. They don't want to, and man, I mean, yeah, I, I find that frustrating. I found it very frustrating for, for years, but um, at the same time, um, you know, it's, uh, I think those of us who, who do speak out, we serve to, you know, I don't do it because I gain from it, but mm. it also serves to, you know, create a, you know, I've had new people discover me and discover my music off yeah. of stuff that has nothing to do with it. And, um, and it also encourages and it emboldens other people, which is really yeah. the, the core of everything I do from my music to my podcasting and my writing and my fitness stuff. It's always been about inspiring other people. So oh, that's, that's been my thing for 15 years since I started. I've always wanted to inspire and motivate people in a positive way. And that, that's grown. That's grown yeah. in different ways. So now I know I'm still inspiring and I'm motivating people, even if it's just to be a little bit more courageous, a little yeah. bit more bold, um, you know, try things in a different way. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to just, you know, be yourself and realize that it's not that dangerous in reality. Um, and so however many thousands of people I can, empower in that way. To me, that's all a win as well. And it fits in with my overall goal.